Um, a very warm welcome to you all. Um, my name is Alison Footit, and I'm the Information Officer for the National Autistic Society Scotland and I have an office space at the Pines and I run these events in partnership with Thriving Families and I've got Carrie from Thriving Families on the call with me today um, and we couldn't manage um, without uh, Fiona from the Pines team who um, does all our administration. Um, so uh, that's the team of us today, um, along, of course, um, with our guest speaker today, Robert Quigley. Um, so we're delighted that Robert has um, agreed to join us um, today. Uh, Robert did come and do an, an in-person session for us, but um, it must be at least three years ago, obviously, with the pandemic um, back at the Pines. So it's so it's great he's been able to uh, to join us um, on screen. Um, so, yeah, very warm welcome um, to, to Robert. Um, so just in case you've not been to any of our sessions before, um, the sessions are, are run, as I said, by the National Autistic Society and Thriving Families. And we're both commissioned services, uh, which means that our funding is from the Highland Council to run information services um, in our area. So my service can help with, as, as you might expect, anything to do with autism um, before and after diagnosis. And Thriving Families can help you with um, any questions about any additional support needs and with education. So, so if you're looking for any um, any help after today's session, please do get in touch with us. And if we can't help, then we'll definitely be able to put you in touch with somebody who can who can help. Um, yeah, so you know, please, please get in touch if we can help. Um, so just to, to um, sort of give a little bit of housekeeping for today, um, if we could ask you to please keep your cameras off and your microphones on mute, um, that will really help us, not only uh, for the sound levels, but also because we're making a film for today's session and that stops you from being on the camera if you don't want to be. Um, so the film will join the amazing bank of films that we've already got on the Pines website and on our YouTube channel. And uh, we really should nominate uh, Fiona for an Oscar for her film editing because um, they're absolutely great. and. Obviously, it means that from today's session, if you want to watch the film again, um, you can do, or if you want to share it with anybody, that will be there for you. So um, that's great. Um, so we're aiming to finish in terms of timing by about 12 o'clock. Um, so um, if, if we've got chance, we're going to um, come to some questions for Robert after his presentation. Um, and in order to do that, if we could ask you please to use the chat box and Carrie is going to be monitoring the chat box um, for today. If you pop any questions in there, then we'll come to them. If we don't get a chance to ask Robert those questions today live, um, then we will uh, contact him afterwards and get him to give some answers. And we will then email you information uh, following today's session, uh, which will include those questions and answers and also any information and links that Robert wants to share. Um, so please don't worry about um, scribbling everything down today. It, um, it should all be there for you. Um, we will put a survey link at the end. We really appreciate um, you filling that out. I know it's not the, the most fun thing to do, but it is really short and it really does help us in terms of um, our funding for ongoing sessions. And uh, obviously we will be looking at new topics uh, for those. It, it seems a long time away, but 2023 planning is um, is already on our minds. So we'll be looking to um, to put some session ideas together. Um, so any any ideas you've got for things you would like us to cover, uh, we, we would appreciate um, your thoughts. Um, and finally, our sessions are going to be taking a summer break after today. And we're going to be back in August on Thursday, the 18th of August. And uh, we're really excited um, that the, the speaker for that day um, is Kieran Rose, who is a really well renowned autistic um, consultant. He speaks all over the world and we're just delighted that um, the National Autistic Society Highland branch, of which Carrie is the chair, has helped us with some funding to um, bring Kieran along. And that will um, link with things like school refusal. So it should be a really timely one um, because it's our August session. So we hope to see you there. Um, just book again as you did today through the Pines website. Um, so that's it from me. I'm just going to hand over to uh, Carrie to say hello and then she will hand over to Robert. Um, but yeah, lovely to see you today. I hope you really enjoy um, this morning's session. Hello. Um, so I, on just what Alison was saying there, yes, I am so excited about Kieran Rose on the 18th. I just I can't even say how excited I am about that. Um, it's It's a I think it's going to be really good for our area. So um, to, to see things from the autistic perspective instead of from 
the um, the professional or medical perspective. It's a, it's an exciting thing to look forward to. So please do sign up for that um, because as you'll know from today, you need to register in order to be given the magic link that lets you get into the to the talk. Um, I don't want to waste up, waste too much time because I know that we have so much to talk about when it comes to gaming. So I'm just going to hand right on over and let's let's get to the meat of the presentation. On to you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alison and um, Carrie. I'm just going to do the usual bit of presenting my screen and then we will get started. I can see Carrie in my little window. Um, just a thumbs up that you can see my screen. Or even just if you can just tell me. Oh, perfect. <laughs> perfect. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for um, inviting me to come along. Um, this is something that I've got a lot of passion about and hopefully some experience that will be of help to you. Uh, and I was asking Alison beforehand about the sort of audience for today and I'm aware that there will be probably a combination of professionals, um, parents, carers, um, and even within that the parent carers, there will be parent carers with children who may have a variety of, um, I suppose, diagnosis, uh, challenges, issues. Um, so I'm going to keep it quite general, but obviously where it's applicable, I will try to apply it to you know, context that might be of particular interest to you. So I should have done my introduction first. Apologies for that. Um, my name is Robert Quigley. My official title, as grand as it sounds, is Collaborative Lead Officer, which basically means that I have a responsibility for quality improvement um, with a digital focus. So previous to that, I was a head teacher of Milton of Lays in Inverness, um, but I've been working in a sort of central capacity for about two and a half years and particularly during lockdown did a lot of work on digital. I've always felt it was really important that alongside the digital learning part of my remit that it was absolutely crucial that we also had the online safety thread going in parallel. So some of you might have heard me speaking about the kind of general online safety issues um, either at schools or at other sessions that I've done and about probably nine months ago gaming it became clear that gaming was becoming uh, an entity on itself. Um, to be honest, it probably could have been that even before that time, because gaming has been something, as you're going to see throughout the presentation today, that has been um, done you know, for quite a long time, probably even longer than perhaps we, we realise. It's deliberately called online gaming because of the connection with the online part and online safety. Gaming itself presents obviously some issues and some challenges, but when you throw in the online gaming part, the issues really start to magnify and to, to multiply. So as I say, my job is to support schools um, and other organisation partners around online safety and also around digital learning. So as we're going through today, uh, and when I ask these questions, these questions that you'll see throughout the presentation are not really intended for you to necessarily um, tell me although feel free if you want to in the chat. It's more to, to get you to think and reflect yourself about your own particular either experience or thoughts on whatever is being, being talked about. So I usually do ask this question, um, what is your experience of gaming? Is it as a gamer? Is it as a parent, carer, as a professional? Or is it as somebody who actually has no experience of gaming? Or perhaps, probably more relevantly or more appropriately, is it someone who thinks that perhaps they do have no relevance or no knowledge of gaming, but perhaps as we go through this, you might actually discover that you do have more knowledge or more experience than perhaps you realised. So as we're going through today, just kind of think back on what your own personal experience of online gaming might be. Now, I've just added in some new content, literally about half an hour ago, from my general online safety um, content because I think it's probably quite useful to have a bit of a context. A lot of the material that I'm going to talk about today comes from a um, very reliable source, which is the Ofcom report. Um, well, one of the Ofcom reports. The Ofcom in the UK do a number of reports looking at digital habits, looking at online trends, and 
I started using this content really quite quite extensively to to form my own presentations. This is a snapshot just from last month of what was happening in 2021 in the UK. And if I was doing the general online safety, I'd be focusing a lot more on the fact that we are now talking about three to four year olds having a digital uh, habit, digital presence, digital behavior in a way that we've never seen before. Even just looking at those stats on this slide, you know, very briefly, you can see, as it says there, 17% of three to four year olds in the UK in 2021 had their own mobile phone. You can also see, as it says at the bottom there, 18% played games online or play games online. I'm not going to go through all of these stats because this is more to do with the, the kind of general online safety, but sometimes I get asked, who is the audience for these sessions? And whether it's gaming or general online safety, the audience really is anybody working with children. And I now almost take away the age completely because as you can see, three to four year olds, so preschoolers and potentially pre preschoolers are actually already engaging in digital behavior. So therefore to think that we can wait to do our online safety messages, to do our online safety teaching, to talk to our kids about how to stay safe until they get to maybe eight or nine or 10, that's going to be too late. Just going through this again, you can see that the numbers start to increase both in terms of mobile phone use, but also in terms of gaming. So 69% of eight to 11 year olds in the UK as part of this Ofcom report suggested or told the, the, the report that um, they played games online. 12 to 15 year olds, it moved to 76%. And then as you go forward, 73%. So again, this is just a reflective question for you to think about. How do these numbers match up with your own situation at home? Are you sitting there surprised? I imagine that a few of you would be sitting looking at the three to four year olds data and thinking, I didn't perhaps imagine that would be the case. I think as the children get older, the more the expectation is that um, that they are engaging. And as you can see there, you're not far off at the 16 to 17 year old age of saying it's 100% in terms of social media, in terms of using apps, in terms of using video sharing platforms, in terms of having mobile phones. So it is worth thinking that once you get to 16 to 17 in the UK, you're almost talking about absolute, um, you know, complete numbers. Gaming, interestingly, is not at that point. So moving on, thinking about gaming. And obviously, as you can see, the, the first part of this uh, stat is back from 2019. Uh, and the real purpose of keeping this stat in is the projection target here. So in 2019, the global PC gaming market was worth 38.4 billion US dollars. This is the PC gaming market, so not your uh, gaming consoles. And it was projected to reach 42.4 billion by 2022, so the year that we're in just now. And I suspect because this was done pre-COVID, that actually those numbers will um, for 2022 will be quite significantly underestimated. Um, I have tried to get hold of the kind of updated projection. I can't find it. But the point I want to make about this particular slide is that when you think about gaming as being a really valuable industry, which clearly it is, talking billions of dollars, if I was to ask you which part of gaming do you think creates the largest part, the probably the temptation would be to think it's to do with the actual purchase of the game. Because a lot of adults, um, and you know, and it maybe it is a generational thing, you know, my generation, your generation, have this image in our heads of going to buy a game in Tesco or in, in the, you know, games, a game store and actually going to the counter, buying the game, paying you £45 for the game, getting your box, getting the disc and taking it home. Obviously, the way that that is now done is quite different. And again, we'll talk about that as we go through. Um, but actually, that really is only a small part of the gaming value. The real investment and the real kind of um, income that's generated through gaming is through advertising, but also through your in-game purchases. And we'll talk about that in a lot more detail towards the end of the presentation. In other words, 
you pay for the game, but that isn't the end of it. You still have other things that you can buy. And in fact, Fortnite is the perfect example of a game that is, when I say perfect, just to clarify, I mean perfect as in a very clever, I don't think it's a very good way, but it's very clever way of marketing a game. So Fortnite is marketed as a free game that costs nothing to buy. And again, most parents hearing that will think, oh, okay, it's free. He's not, he or she is not having to go and spend 50 pounds on a game, it's free. However, as you'll know from any of you that have children who play Fortnite, it is anything but a free game. There are so many parts of the game that require you to spend money, but the actual purchase of the game is free. So that value of whatever the value is in dollars is not just made up of the actual purchase of the game. Very quickly, I'm going to skim through this part and we will kind of come back to it again, but just to sort of confirm that in terms of online, online bullying, in terms of inappropriate behaviour, it is happening obviously through gaming as you would expect. I used this slide in my general session and once you take out the top two at school on the bus, what you see is that nearly every other um, bullying place, location, is digital or has got some kind of excuse me, some kind of digital um, connection to it, social media, text messages, and as you can see there, gaming as well. And again, another different survey, 23% of people asked in this survey had been bullied in an online game. The reason that I talked about gaming being a separate entity is because the behaviours and the things that happen in gaming in terms of online safety are quite different to the way they happen on, say, social media. There's different ways, for instance, that grooming may happen. There's different ways, for instance, that bullying may happen in gaming. It's a little bit different to, well, quite a big bit different to what happens in, you know, your social media and your Snapchat, your WhatsApp. It's done in a different way. So there's a few elephants in the room to get to get round. Um, and we're going to have a look at some of the I suppose what you would class as the, the kind of stereotypes. And again, I know there'll be people in the, in the audience today who are probably as aware of some of these trends, some of these things uh, as perhaps I am. But there'll be other people who perhaps have asked you, you know, without seeing the data, you know, what is your, your typical gamer? A lot of people will be tempted to say it would be, you know, a 17 year old boy. Um, and that's quite understandable because your, your sort of typical gamer that's portrayed in the media, that's portrayed in film, television, tends to be your teenage or just beyond teenage, your university college student, you know, the kind of geeky gaming sort of stereotype and quite often it's a male. As the first um, box on the left shows, it is true that overall gaming is something that is done more frequently by men, by males. But the gap is a lot closer than perhaps you would have expected. So not taking into account ages, but just, you know, kind of, I guess, taking an average of, of all the different age groups, men, 54%, women, 46%. So it's really interesting that that gap is nowhere near as big. I, I think if somebody, if you ask people on the street, you know, who, who, what's the gender difference in gaming? I think a number of people would probably be tempted to go quite high on the males and quite low on the, the females. When you break it down to age, it, it gets really interesting because as I say, the actual average, as you can see from that, your average gamer taking into account all the ages is round about 33. It is a male. So your average gamer, if you were trying to create the sort of stereotype of what a, a typical gamer would be, it's actually a 33 year old man. Um, and we'll look at the types of games in a second. But if you look at the stats between men and women, girls and boys, it really is not that different. So purpose for that start really is just to sort of refresh your thinking that if you're thinking that you've got, you know, two boys and a girl at home and you're thinking it's the boys that I need to be, you know, really careful of in terms of gaming, the stats would definitely suggest differently. And they would suggest that you definitely need to have that conversation and, you know, just really be clear that, that girls are gaming increasingly. In terms of where and the types of games that girls and boys will um, play, 
again, interesting. Um, this again came from the Ofcom report. Um, so on the left, you've got the boys' percentages, and on the right, you've got the girls' percentages. Um, some of the descriptions about the games are perhaps not that helpful. Like, for instance, where it says multiplayer games, um, I would have preferred if they'd actually taken that section out and just put in the types of multiplayer games. In other words, you know, Fortnite's in there. So Fortnite, to me, would be described as probably a shooter game, um, nowhere near as, as graphic and as violent as your Grand Theft Autos, your Calls of Duty, your um, Assassin's Creed. But there is absolutely an element of having to shoot. Um, because typically, if you're looking for a sort of standard that boys and girls will play, boys are drawn far more towards the action, adventure, shooter games and the sports games. So just to kind of illustrate that, you know, it's, it's, your, it's your Battlefront, it's your Call of Duty, it's your Grand Theft Auto, it's your FIFA. Girls are drawn far more towards, I guess, what you would call the sort of cerebral kind of games. The games that require more thought. The games that require more strategy. The games that require more, like as I said, deep thinking. Your puzzles, your quizzes, the wordles, those sorts of games. So although gaming, you know, in terms of the, the stats is quite level, it's quite even, and it's, and it's leveling out. In terms of the types of games, it's actually quite different. And there's a real attraction for boys to play those kind of impulse games, those action games, the ones that get their adrenaline pumping. I don't think you can measure adrenaline, but if you could, between a boy and a girl gaming, what you'd find typically is that the boy, the male, would have you know a kind of higher level of adrenaline because they're playing the games that will create that adrenaline rush. Whereas girls, far more considered, far more, um, you know, sort of, Let's say deeper thinking. Now that's a, a massive generalization. That's based on the average. There will obviously be girls who are just as into the shooter games whose adrenaline is going through the roof. But typically, based on the, the evidence, and this is again from the Ofcom report, that's what it would suggest. I also just threw in um, that little box on the right. Um, quite helpful, I think, in terms of that obviously the previous stat talks about how often it talks about sorry, it talks about who is gaming. Doesn't go into details about how long they're gaming for. Whereas this one here, um, from Childwise, suggests that boys are playing more intensely. So it is fair to say that, again, your typical boy gamer will play nearly average four hours a day versus girls who play for a, quite a significantly less time. Is that linked to the genre of game, the type of game? Is it linked to the fact that the games that, that girls are playing typically don't have a kind of end point perhaps as much? Whereas on the shooter games, you know, if you're playing something like Fortnite, you have to get to a certain point to be able to save the game. There's a lot of the puzzles and quizzes and you know your Minecraft, you can stop, save at any point you want to. It would also probably suggest that girls are more capable or more able to be able to realize when they've reached that point that they need to switch off. I just put this slide in literally two minutes before we started here because as I was talking pre um, the session starting, it, it, I got thinking about the kind of imbalance between um, girls and boys in terms of gaming. So I haven't looked at this slide in, in great detail, but basically I wanted to illustrate that a lot of the stereotypes that exist in the offline world, you know, this kind of male orientated um, world that we, I think, probably unfortunately still live in is absolutely replicated when it comes to, to online and to gaming. Um, as you can see from the slide on the right, top esports, so playing electronic games for a, a, you know, a profession to earn money, just look at the difference in terms of um, the tournament earnings. You know, you think about your tennis and your um, uh, Serena Williams versus Djokovic and Nadal, how much earnings difference there is there. It's starting to close. There's clearly a long way to go. This does link in to the idea of, you know, really encouraging girls to get involved in digital world, whether it is gaming or some kind of other, other issue or some kind of other area. Um, there's a real difficulty at the moment because there isn't an appeal or an attraction financially to do that. Wait, um, this isn't, by the way, meant to be all about um, sort of female, male 
um, disbalance. It's just it's quite interesting when you talk about gaming, just how much it um, how much it does come into play. Another slide um, to talk about the types of games, and this is not this is now we're moving away from the gender and more into age. Um, just looking at the types of games and how they change between eight to eleven age and twelve to fifteen, and probably quite helpful to think about that one in terms of top end primary into lower end secondary. Um, there's a few commonalities. Minecraft, you know, continues to be something that's played across both age ranges, but it does tend to drop. Things like Pokemon tend to drop. Um, I love stroke to spare the fact that Lego only appears in the eight to eleven years and then disappears completely off the map in terms of you know high stats. Um, things like FIFA remain quite consistent. So it's interesting just you could I mean, each of these slides you could sit and, and, and sort of pick out for for hours and hours. But it's interesting the commonalities and how some will sustain and some will drop down. Fortnite is a, is a good example and actually I'm quite surprised at that the two comparisons there because Fortnite in some ways is almost seen as a rite of passage before you get into your Call of Duty, before you get into your Assassin's Creed, before you get into your Grand Theft Auto. There tends to be this jump between Fortnite which is seen generally as a less violent shooter game, moving on to something like Apex Legends, then moving on to something like Call of Duty, Assassin's Creed, and then potentially on to something like Grand Theft Auto. Um, so Fortnite typically, I mean, if I take my own children as an example, I've got a, a 14 year old son and he wouldn't be seen dead playing Fortnite now um, because it's not the done thing amongst his friends. Although I know he does play, uh, he just wouldn't tell them and he also just wouldn't play with them. There's still something about the, the game itself which appeals to him. So another question to sort of reflect upon, and again, we'll probably tease this out more, is that if you were to ask your child what their main purpose when gaming was, what do you think they would say? I suppose I could ask that question in a different way and say, if I asked you, what do you think the main purpose of gaming would be? And the obvious answer, of course, is that you would say, well, is it not to play games? And it absolutely is. But if you look at the, the stats and if you, you think about this, um, I suppose, deeper, as, the, as the, the, the kind of top red headline says, gaming is a social space for many. And that is absolutely the case. The children I speak to, the research that I read, absolutely backs this up. Now, I don't think it's quite at the point where you would say that the purpose of gaming is 50-50, one to play a game and the other half to, um, you know, to chat to your friends. But there's a huge, huge connection between the social part, as you can see from the, from the stats there. In other words, when a child goes on to play Fortnite, goes on to play FIFA, there's a huge part of the reason they're doing that that is about socialising, as much as there is about the actual game itself. And that in itself obviously creates issues around the online safety part. Um, I had a real eye-opening moment during lockdown when my, well, he was 12 at the point, son, um, now 14, but 12 at the time, was about to have an Xbox ban for various reasons. And what I said to him was, I said, you're about to have a ban for a week from the Xbox. Your behaviour's not been acceptable. That's what's going to happen. And he turned to me very calmly and just said, Dad, if you do that, you do realise I'm going to have no social contact with my friends. Now, part of that was down to, to the lockdown. The other part of it was a real eye opener for me. And it made me realise just exactly what I've been saying that actually for him, a, quite a significant part of the reason that he plays games is actually to speak to his friends. Now, I can kind of almost hear in my ear people thinking and saying, but that's not a conversation. I've heard my child playing the game. That's not a conversation. It's one word, two word, three word, four word shouts. It's not speaking respectfully. It's not waiting in turn. It's not asking questions respectfully. Absolutely agree but it's still a conversation. So one of the really important things I think for us as adults is to rethink our thinking and to think that actually this is not, that the online world and the gaming world in particular is not gonna replicate the offline world exactly. We might describe that as being not a conversation about not talking to each other, but if you ask the kids, what were you doing? They would tell you they've been talking. It's just a different type of talking. So when we think about the gaming 
world and gaming as being a social thing. It genuinely is. It doesn't mean that our children are going to speak that way when they go offline. Children, I mean, this is the kind of really, I suppose, eye-opening part of, of gaming and social media in general, is that children can go from five minutes ago on a phone or on a gaming device talking in a way that we wouldn't recognise to then all of a sudden meeting in person and transforming back into what we would consider to be, you know, normal, everyday conversations. To them, it's just one thing. We look upon it as online, offline world, but to them, it's just a different platform to speak on. But if you ask them, I mean, my son keeps using the word cringe. If I said to him, why are you speaking differently online? He, he would use that word. He would say, I'm, I'm really cringing, Dad. Why are you asking me about the online, offline world. It's just my world. So that's another part I think we need to reflect on is the fact that we need to almost get past our uncomfortable, I suppose it's terms of how we would consider, um, you know, children to behave. Now, this is not in any way suggesting that we should allow them to behave inappropriately, unacceptably online. I'm just talking about behaviours and conversations and communications that perhaps we don't recognise as being the norm, um, you know, from when they when they are offline. A few more stats to look at. Um, again, as the question says on the right there, does this surprise you? Why would the numbers be so high? And the stat I'm referring to is the fact that in 2020, and again, I haven't got the updated one, and actually for the purpose of this point, it doesn't matter whether it has increased or not. Minecraft was the most viewed game of 2020. Not played, viewed. So Minecraft had 201 billion views in 2020. Now I have to say, when I a lot of the stats and a lot of stuff on this presentation, when I read it for the first time, I kind of went, okay, I understand that. This one kind of blew me away a little bit. Um, that means that 201 billion views of Minecraft, which is pretty astonishing from, from my point of view. Why is it? A few reasons. I would suggest one of them, is I mean, perhaps the obvious one is so that children can find out about how to get past certain points, certain um, aspects of the game that perhaps they're not very good at. So that's probably one of the reasons, trying to find out how they can um, you know, get better at the game. Um, just on that point, or just as a kind of an aside, just be aware of the increasing a number of people who are using things like uh, fans only. Now, fans only is something that we tend to associate with adult, you know, porn sites, etc. that you have to pay to get, if you like, you know, the kind of exclusive content. It's kind of now appearing in gaming as well. So perhaps on YouTube or on TikTok or on whatever platform it is, really successful gamers are now starting to use that same fans only approach of charging or subscription to be able to see the really good content. So take Fortnite as an example. There are gamers out there who know how to get past some of the really difficult points. And they're now starting to ask their fans, their followers to actually pay to see that content. They'll give you a teaser of the free stuff, but they'll make you pay or subscribe to see the really, really good stuff. The flip side to that is we may have children in Highland or we will have children in Highland who are seeing potential in making some money out of this. And again, we will talk about money in a second, but seeing that if they're good at this game, this is a way that they could actually really start to make a little bit of extra money by charging people in a subscription way for people to see their own content. And typically what they're showing is themselves playing that game and getting past these, these various points. <laughs> the other reason why um, Minecraft, I think, and Roblox and the other games on there are so high is because there seems to be a, a kind of increasing culture that when a child is told to come off the game that they're playing, so let's just use Minecraft because it's part of this slide, playing Minecraft perhaps for an hour, two hours, and mum, dad, whoever it is at home says it's time to come off. A lot of children are using this as the next step down from coming off the game. In other words, if they came off that game cold turkey and just switch the game off um and i have heard and, and maybe it doesn't sound a, a, as bizarre as it sounded to me but if you imagine a child being told come off that game you've been playing for two hours and go and do your homework 
I know of multiple instances where the child has opened their homework daughter and just put a black pen right through it because they've had absolutely no chance to come down from what they were doing. If you imagine in Minecraft, the music, the colour, the storyline, the creativity, the freedom, all those different things that they've got during that game and all of a sudden they're being asked to do something as mundane and as formal as homework. So a lot of children and I have to say parents are actually now recognising that allowing their child to watch somebody else play in the game is a kind of a step away from playing and a step towards coming back to the, if you like, to, to normality, back to reality. And again, just to be clear, I'm not suggesting that this should mean that a child plays for two or three hours on their Xbox, they then come off and spend two or three hours watching somebody else play in the game. I'm just thinking about this as a strategy to potentially use if you've got a child who struggles to come off the game. Give them five, ten minutes to actually go and watch somebody else. And I'd be amazed at just how that very small um, little strategy might help because they're no longer playing the game. So they've lost that kind of real sense of being immersed in that reality, but they're still involved in the game. And it just helps them to come down so that when you do say to them, right, that's time up, they're in a much better place and a much more likelihood of being able to cope when that game is finished. And as I say, I can talk about countless examples where I've made that same mistake and told my child, you know, to come off the game and we've had a major um, meltdown, a major, major um, behaviour issue because I've given them no time, no warning and no opportunity to sort of come down from that. A colleague of mine described coming off a game um, in a quite similar way to coming out of the cinema. If you imagine going to view and you go and see the film, the new Top Gun film, you're in that world, you're seeing whatever's happening, I haven't seen it, Tom Cruise and everything that's going on. And as soon as the film's finished, imagine if you came out of that cinema room straight back into the bright lights of Inverness. It makes Inverness sound far more glamorous than it is. But if you know what I mean, what you actually do is you actually go out into the lobby, you have that walk, still in relative darkness, into the main entrance part, and you've actually got maybe 30 seconds, a minute, a minute and a half before you do hit the outside light, you do hit reality. I think it's quite a good comparison in terms of gaming, just to understand what children have to go through when they're asked to stop playing the game just like, like that. OK, so I'm going to show you a very short video. Um, and the purpose of this video really is to talk about just how quickly in the world of gaming things can go wrong. Here we go with the video. Don't worry about the sound, the sound isn't important to this one. OK, I'll come back out of this one. Um, now, obviously, that is for the, the purpose of creating that video been designed as a quite a tame um, reflection of what would happen in a, in a game. Clearly, in the real world of gaming, it could be a lot more brutal than that. It could be a lot more the language would probably be quite uh, a lot harsher, a lot more uh, direct, but it's the speed with which this turns. Now, obviously, there are lots of questions that you could ask about, you know, was he playing with his friend? You know, was Gamer888 a friend or was it somebody random that he was playing with? But it almost doesn't matter because there is every likelihood that in that game, if Jack did something wrong, if he played the game incorrectly, made a mistake, as has happened here, he shot um, Gamer888. The offline world and the online world, and this is where this contradiction comes in, is because this friend, Gamer888, if you work on the assumption that he is a friend, you know, in the offline world, would be far more forgiving. In the online gaming world, it, it, it's the end of the world. As you saw from that, one mistake and the conversation tone changed completely. You can see from Jack's eyes just how shocked and how stunned he is by what happened here. 
The other purpose for this one really is to show that the kind of, I suppose, the online safety um, advice that was given probably not too long ago of making sure that if your child's gaming, that they're in the same room as you, that you know they're, they're in a place that you can see them. Unless you were watching you know, that conversation taking place, you are not gonna know what just happened in that situation. That could easily have been a headset and lots of talking to each other. But actually, again, unless you're hearing that, you're not going to know what happened. You could have been sitting next to Jack and you could have been replying to a message on your phone and in that 30 seconds that that conversation took place on the game, you would miss it. So the reason I'm saying that is that for me, it's far more important that we focus not so much on trying to, if you like, be next to our child every single time they're gaming or every single time they're on social media. It's more about building up that trust and it's building up that digital trust that they feel they can come and tell you. Jack clearly needs to tell somebody what has just happened there. If you throw in the addition of vulnerability, you know, whether it is a child who has a particular, you know, diagnosis or particular, you know, additional support need challenge, whatever it is that the issue is, the complexity, the addition of that being thrown in would make that even more important that that conversation takes place. But it can't just be about us as parents spotting every single thing that happens. If we did that, we would never leave our child safe at uh, child's side would never send our children to school because if we had to be there beside them in the offline world to pick up on every single thing that they built up or happened to them, we would never be able to live our own lives. So for me, it's far more important to be able to build up that conversation, to build up that trust. And we do that by some of the ways that I've already spoken about. It's by actually rethinking our thinking about gaming, convincing our children that actually we do understand or that we're trying to understand what the gaming world looks like rather than simply us saying to them oh i don't know anything about this game i can't help you rather than us saying stop wasting your time on this game it's a complete waste of time rather than saying right come off the game and start your homework it's the little subtle things that we can do which will make our children actually believe that we're trying to bridge that gap which might then mean that when Jack needs to speak to somebody about what just happened there, he might feel that he can have that conversation with somebody at home or someone that he trusts because they kind of are trying to get what he's doing. The danger, of course, if that conversation doesn't take place is the fallout from that. Will that spill out into the offline world? Will it spill out the next time Jack plays the game? And when we get on to talking about potentially the idea of being groomed online. What if in this conversation, we can't obviously see it because we only see in the two way conversation. What if there was a third person in that conversation who happened to be an online predator? So an adult trying to find that vulnerable child that they could target. Jack is absolutely ripe and perfect for that person to try to target because they know that Jack at that point is feeling extremely vulnerable. Jack is feeling really low. Jack's self-esteem has been completely knocked. How would Jack react if somebody else in that group, potentially your online predator, stepped in and said, oh, that's really, really harsh, Jack. Come and speak to me on Snapchat. Come and speak to me in a different game. Come and speak to me in a different forum. I need to make sure that you're feeling better. I don't agree with what happened there. Whatever they would say, at that moment in time, Jack would have to be very strong and very confident in himself to be able to say no, because Jack is looking for that support. It comes back to that same thing about we need to make sure that our children are feel comfortable enough to speak to us about what's happening. We'll talk a little bit more about, you know, the kind of, I suppose, the, 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 the kind of grooming side of things as we move forward. So moving on to think about what are the challenges from online gaming. And I talked about this already at the very start, which is the way that we buy games these days has changed almost unrecognisably. Children can now and adults can now buy games without going anywhere near a shop. And that makes the age rating, the PEGI rating, very, very difficult to uh, enforce. Now, clearly, a 10 year old couldn't walk into Tesco um, and buy Grand Theft Auto. 
because the Peggy rating is 18, rightly, and that child will be challenged, to be stopped, and won't be able to buy it. There is nothing to stop an adult, older brother, older sister, friend, who's that age, going in and buying it, because the age restriction is, is only applied to the person that's buying it. However, if they're buying it online, through Steam or whatever platform it is that you can buy the game, you download it, so there's no box, there's no disc, nothing like that happens. How do you regulate that? And the answer is you cannot. The only regulation that you can do as a parent is to have an organised way for the child to be able to pay for it. Clearly, children don't have credit cards age 10. So for them to be able to actually buy the game, at some point, somebody's had to give them that payment method. Um, whether it was credit card, whether it's vouchers or cards, um, yeah, voucher cards. Um, but that's been given to them at some point. So there is an element of control. But the legality around the age rating is only applied to the actual purchase, not necessarily to the game itself. We've talked about the immersion issues clearly, whether it's online or offline gaming. And when I say offline gaming, I mean games that where someone's playing on the Xbox or playing on the phone against themselves. You know, there are lots and lots of games that children can play, adults play, which there's no social interaction, there's no playing with anybody else, it's just playing against the computer on FIFA perhaps, or playing against themselves. The immersion issues, that kind of playing for an intense amount of time without a break, is something that happens whether it's online or offline. I don't have a magic wand to wave and say the answer is that you should allow them to have X amount of time or you know Y amount of time. For me, there's a couple of really key questions around that. One is how well will your child cope when they are told to take a break? Now, whether that's a break because they've finished playing for the day, whether that's a break because they're having a built in break before they go back to the game. How do they cope with that? Do they need that sort of softer break from the game of going to play or going to watch somebody else play? It certainly isn't advisable to let them or to send them off to do something that is going to be very challenging for them, like, as I say, homework, um, you know, going to um, set the table for dinner. They're going to have to have something in most cases to actually break that, that, that kind of game. But the key thing is, as I say, it's not so much about you know, how long they should play for, it's about how they're going to cope when they come off that. And if the intention is that they go back on the game later, how long do they need to come out of that fantasy world to rejoin, if you like, the real world and actually, you know, get back into that real world for however long it is before they join the game again? As you saw from the stats, on average in the UK, it's male boys playing for four hours, girls for about two hours. Um, as I say, there isn't a magic wand. We were speaking, um, you know, before the, the, the session started um, with Carrie, and, and she made a really good point, which is when we ask our children to come off the game, why are we doing that? Is there a purpose to it? In our heads, are we thinking that's long enough? What does long enough mean? You know, now again, I'm not suggesting for any situation that we would say they should play for eight, nine, ten hours, but having a reason, what is the purpose for them coming off? Are they done for the day? If they are, it's making that clearly understood. I would definitely suggest that you build in, you're coming off the game and I'd like you to do. And again, not something mundane, inverted commas, but something that is going to allow them to channel away from what they've been doing. But it is back to thinking, you know, is there a reason why they're coming off? I gave another example before the session started of someone that I was speaking to at a session about six months ago who said, that prior to the session I'd done with them, what they used to do was say to their child, right, come off the game. And the parent, the child would say, why? What am I going to do? Nothing to do. I'm bored. Very typical responses. And the parent said, we're going to go and watch a film just now. So come and sit beside me and we're going to watch a film. And she realised just the irony of saying that was actually to the child. It was almost no different to what they had just been doing previously. Now, this wasn't being used as a strategy to get them off the game, because actually the plan was to spend the next two and a half hours watching a film. And the child was thinking, well, I could still be playing, because actually there's not much of a difference between watching this film, which was probably about a similar kind of thing that they were playing in the game. Um, so it's just, just thinking about, you know, what is our method for getting the children off the game? Um, 
and it's just being clear. And again, not using the fact that perhaps just because we don't understand, say, the principles of how to play Fortnite or how um, a particular game works, that shouldn't stop us parenting because parenting is parenting regardless of whether it's digital or not. It's the same principles. Come inside from playing football in the garden because your dinner's ready. It's having a clear explanation and a clear rationale rather than just simply saying, come off. We'll talk about money in a second. Um, mentioned at the very start that a significant amount of money that's spent in the gaming industry is not necessarily in the purchase of the games. It is in the in-game purchases, things like loot boxes, which, depending on your viewpoint, may actually be part of a very early introduction to the idea of gambling and taking a risk. Unfortunately, I think this last one in this, this slide is very accurate that as adults, we don't take the time to understand about games or even to understand the social benefits. I think to a lot of adults, gaming is something that I wouldn't say it's seen as an evil, but it's seen as something that if we had a choice, we probably wouldn't want our children to do. Flip that on its head. How can we use what the child is doing, you know, to really turn something, to turn something positive? Because like it or, or not, all around our kids, they are seeing examples of where people of a similar age um, to them are actually making a really successful, uh, I was gonna say career, I'm not sure it is career, but making a really successful time of gaming. So we can no longer, as a slide in about two or three times is gonna say, we can no longer say to our kids, this is just a hobby. This is just something that you're gonna get bored of because gaming, unfortunately or fortunately, is here to stay. We've already touched upon the online predator um, and that's the best way that I can think to describe what, what we were sort of talking about here. In effect, the adult who is trying to find a way to connect with um, young people for whatever particular um, need or requirement that they have, um, are targeting gaming as a particularly effective way to be able to, to make these connections number of different ways it happens via chat rooms, via the forums that are discussing the games, but typically during the actual game itself. So thinking about something like FIFA, you know, maybe it's five or six people playing FIFA together um, and very, very safe in all honesty, if that group of people are all friends who all know each other, it's a locked, closed group where there is no opportunity for an outsider to come into that group. But what frequently happens, unfortunately, is that your online predator, who happens to be very, very clever and very switched on about how to infiltrate these groups, actually doesn't find it that difficult to get into these groups. They use very, very, what would appear to us to be quite obvious strategies, such as saying, can I join your, you know, making a request to join the group, saying, I'm friends with, and typically using the name of somebody who's not in that group. You know, so if there's six children in the group, and maybe one of them isn't there saying, well, I'm friends with Mark. And of course, Mark's not there to say that's not someone that I know. So often it can be as simple as making that connection between somebody in that group. Sometimes they can actually kind of play the, the, the poor me card of saying I've been kicked out of my group and I'm really, really feeling low. I'm struggling to get into a group. Would you please let me in? And, and as hard as that is to believe, Sometimes that's how simple it is for that person to infiltrate that group. Once they're in that group, that's when the real danger comes in. And there are a few telltale signs that you can look out for. And, and the first one is the one that I've put on the slide here. That classically, your online predator trying to pop, trying to, to make that connection with young people will not say an awful lot in that group. But don't let that sort of disguise the fact that they are very much engaging in that group but they're listening and they're reading. So they're reading the chat, they're listening to the comments. Sadly, typically they're making notes because what they're trying to do is they're trying to build up a profile of, on back to that kind of FIFA group, of those six children or five children that are in that group, who is the one that is the most vulnerable? Who's the one that potentially is displaying uh, perhaps some kind of trait that might be persuadable to come and join a different group 
or ultimately to go to a different platform completely. Quite often the movement from um, gaming is that if the online predator is able to infiltrate somebody who appears to be vulnerable and makes that kind of connection move, they'll move to something like Snapchat or Instagram or WhatsApp to have the next level of conversation. Obviously, they're moving towards the idea of meeting in, in person. Often it falls at various points, but sadly, as we know, there are a small number of children who will go from being, you know, just basically asked on a gaming forum, gaming chat, to meet somebody on Snapchat or WhatsApp, to ultimately meeting uh, in person. So we need to be quite, you know, quite aware of the fact that it does actually, and a small number of children does actually happen. It's very, very easy when you look at it in the cold light of day to spot who is this online predator. As I say, often not speaking, often listening and reading. Probably the biggest telltale sign, and again, very difficult for children to understand this, but go back to that FIFA game and imagine that the game is playing out and it's currently nil-nil and there's a minute to go and everybody in that game is entirely focused on the game itself. How confident would you be that your child or somebody that you know, if somebody asked at that point, as your child's about to score the winning goal, where do you live? Or what's, you know, what's your age? What school do you go to? How confident would you be that they would actually stop the game and say, right guys, put a pause on the game. I've got a question to ask or to answer. Or even more, I think probably ludicrous to say, no, let's stop the game again. I'm not allowed to tell you that information because I've had online safety lessons in school. Mum and dad have said to me I shouldn't do that. It's just not going to happen. And unfortunately, there'll be some children at that point that may just blurt that piece of information out. Now, that information itself is nowhere near enough for your online predator to make that, you know, that profile picture complete. But over months, and typically it's a five or six month job, they will start to build up that profile. They'll start to build up the pieces of information. They may well disregard everybody in that group and think, no, just by getting the conversation, by hearing it, by the questions that I've asked very subtly at the right time, as I say, usually when the game is at its absolute peak and the children are focused entirely on the game, they may realise there's nobody in this game that I think is likely to be vulnerable enough to be able to prize away. But there'll be somebody somewhere who they can make that move with. And again, quite often think back to the, um, the example watched in that video. If that boy in that video had been contacted at that point by an online predator saying to them, come and play in our game, the way that your friend spoke to you was horrible. In fact, come and play in our game because actually we're offering incentives. We're actually offering children or offering people that join our game a thousand V-Bucks in, uh, in Fortnite, 10,000 Robux. A Roblox, Robux in Roblox. Offering incentives, that sometimes can be subtle enough, but often it can just simply be the, the, the promise of a much nicer environment. And as I say, in that situation there, the boy that was in the video was feeling at a very low ebb. And depending on how resilient he was, would he have been able to turn that away, thinking, at least I can go and speak to this person, um, who at that point, he's thinking, is a friend of somebody else? So there's no thought of this could be an adult um, and I can actually get my self-esteem boosted again. So that's a kind of a, I suppose, a, a quick snapshot as to why your online predator may target gaming as a particularly useful way in. Because as it says in the second bullet point there, during a game, kids and young people are particularly focused on the game and often Every rule we've ever been taught around online safety, what they should or shouldn't do, they may forget to do. Lots of things to talk about. I um, realise that I'm into race on time wise. Um, how would you know if someone's struggling with online gaming? Lots of things on there. Probably the standout ones are children struggling to do the things that they used to do. So kids that would go out and constantly want to be outside playing football, playing tennis, doing gymnastics, running around, will stop doing that. They'll go. Um, they'll probably say things like, the only thing that makes me happy is gaming. They may be looking constantly to try to find a way to actually get money to spend in the game. It is worth pointing out that the World Health Organization uh, about 18 months ago actually 
listed gaming addiction as uh, an actual recognized uh, condition. However, the criteria required to be considered medically or clinically, probably clinically is a better word, as being addicted to gaming is incredibly high to the point where 99% of children, despite you know, mom, dad, me saying, I think you must be addicted to gaming, would actually not meet the requirements. It's quite a significant um, set of criteria that have to be met. There are clinics now in England, particularly for addiction to gaming. But as I say, the criteria scale is very, very high to actually get a formal diagnosis when it comes to addiction. And it's all these things, but all these things on a really grand scale. Again, that's not to say that children that we're working with and that we, we have at home are not you know, obsessed with games. It doesn't mean we tackle it any differently, but when we say addicted to gaming and we're using that clinical term, um, it's very, very hard to actually meet that criteria. I mentioned very briefly about the fact that it, children find it very, very hard now to hear adults saying that this gaming online influencer world is not something that's real because all around them, they are seeing examples of this. This was an example of a gamer, um, as you can see here, who last December signed his first professional contract with an esports team. And he was given a 23,000 boning, a signing bonus um, to play for this particular company. Now, like we do when children tell us they want to be you know, world-class singers or world-class gymnasts, we have to give them a little bit of a reality check and tell them that it's probably unlikely. But we would never dream of saying to them, don't be ridiculous. You know, to a child who goes to gymnastics, don't be ridiculous. You are never, ever going to be a world-class gymnast. We would gently encourage them, but we'd also give them that reality check. When it comes to gaming and the online world, we do that completely differently. We do it all the time. We tell our kids, stop wasting your time. This is not something real. Children, if you ask them, who their role models and who their heroes are, I would almost guarantee in that list of people will probably be at least one influencer or a gamer or a streamer or a YouTuber or a TikToker, because these are the people who are real to them. Now, I'm not going to pretend that all of these people are the sorts of people that you'd want our children to be, you know, um, you know, sort of aspiring to be, but certainly, um, they're very much part of their world. Mentioned already, I think, about the fact that gaming's been going on for quite some time. This is an interesting one, that PlayStation 2 is still the best-selling video game console of all time. It was out, well, how many years ago it was, but um, PlayStation 2 still outstretches and outstrips Xbox, um, PlayStation 4. So it has been doing something that we've been doing for a long, long time complicated part for us in terms of online safety is the fact that when you throw in the online part, as we've already talked about, that's when some of the real challenges come in. I, I, I'm going to really start rattling through these. Um, never judge a book by its cover. Well, let's ch change the word book for game. How confidently could you say from just the title whether this these games are suitable for, say, an 11-year-old girl? If your child came to you and said, I want to buy Outriders, would you simply say to them, yeah, no problem at all? Would you ask them what age it is? Would you ask them what the game is about? Would you look at reviews? I would suggest that we don't say no immediately. But we actually engage in a conversation based on the resources that I'm going to talk to you about that will actually give you a much better picture so that you're much more informed about actually what um, these games are about. Again, another complication we've got is that on different consoles, some games have got different ratings. FIFA, for instance, on some consoles is rated 3+. plus. On other ones, it's rated 13. Um, Assassin's Creed jumps between 18 and 15, depending on how aggressive and violent the game is. Very, very hard for us to keep up. So again, I would suggest that you don't, I suppose in your head, base the fact that when you, someone says Assassin's Creed, you either immediately think it's always going to be 15 or it's always going to be 18. It's worth checking that specific version of the game on a specific console. I'm going to talk about the resources in a second, so I'm going to jump past this bit because I really want to get on to the bit about money. So um, in April to June 2020, most popular pocket money purchases to the sum on average of £239 a year was Roblox and Fortnite. 
um, the traditional pocket money spending, Lego, books, magazines, sweets, um, football boots, it is a thing of the past. Where children still get pocket money, a lot of the money has been spent on um, the games themselves, whether it's buying the game or whether it's the in-app purchases. So let's look at um, the in-app purchases. Now, this is a really short video. Don't worry about the sound because um, it's more about the wee boy Maxwell's um, reactions here, which you'll be able to see. <laughs> I'm not sure if the sign was working or not, but you can probably tell from his look. What he'd done there was he'd opened some loot boxes, and we'll talk about loot boxes in two seconds. Um, he opened 11 of them. In the first loot box, he got something that he'd already previously had. And in the 11th one, he got exactly what he wanted. I'm not sure if we had Maxwell's parents here, they could be able to explain when Maxwell was last as animated as he was when he opened that last loot box. It was sheer jubilation. And that's what the gaming world and the gaming um, components can do to you. And that's where the real attraction now pull is with the kind of in-app purchase. So let's just move to, as it says there, it isn't just a click of a button, there you go. Um, that was speeded up, but actually that whole process of opening that loot box is completely drawn out. The animation, the noise, the sort of thrill of it as you open that loot box, which you saw with Maxwell, that is the appeal. So what is a loot box? Well, a loot box, as you probably will know, is an option that young people have to get an item that they desperately want. If you imagine in Fortnite, it could be a weapon, it could be a skin, so an outfit, and typically, these guns, these weapons, these outfits are actually available to buy just in a normal way. So let's imagine that there's a weapon that a child could go and buy for £15 or they could take a risk and buy a loot box. And the loot box typically is about 99p. Sometimes it's slightly more than that. And when they open that loot box, they're opening it knowing that they may get a range of things, ranging from the very, very best, which obviously is what they want, down to the very, very standard, um, cheap, low-end item. So the weapon that they probably get for free anyway. But what they're doing is they're taking that risk. For 99p, they potentially could get that £15 weapon. And it's not so much the one-off loot box, as Maxwell did there, it's the 11 loot boxes that he bought. And again, we'll talk about how he managed to pay for that in a second. But he bought the 11 in the hope that by buying those 11 loot boxes in those 11 would be somewhere that weapon that he particularly wanted. You saw at the very start when he opened the first one, he got something that he already had. It was, wasn't devastation, but it was real. Oh, what a waste of time. And that miss, as it says there, almost drove him on to keep opening the boxes in the hope that he would get something. Because strangely enough, when you buy 10 loot boxes, typically you're not going to get that thing that you want in the very first time. I'm going to kind of link in this gambling thing. You go on a, a bandit machine in, in the pub. The first time you spin the, the button, you're not going to win the jackpot. It's going to try to tease you and tempt you. And the teasing and tempting in the loot box is the, the sound. It's the animation. It's the fact that it's, it's, it's an actual process. It's not just simply press a button and it opens. The attraction of a loot box is that way to get that thing that they desperately need. In some cases, that gun, that weapon, that skin is needed to actually get past a particular difficult stage. In some cases, it may actually be required. But perhaps a child that said to mum or dad, can I get 15 pounds? And they're told, no, of course not. They're thinking, well, I have got, for whatever reason, two or three pounds in credit on the machine. 
or maybe spend that on three loot boxes. That's the kind of connection in terms of the gambling part is it's that taking that risk, that measured risk, not knowing what you're getting, but hoping to get that really, really big thing. And the advertising around that is really intense. In some cases, the advert will actually sit at the top of the game. I've seen it in Fortnite where it sits at the top right hand corner, basically saying, buy me, buy me as a loot box, um, buy me for 99p and you never know what you might get. Sometimes it will be the actual gun weapon in the other corner saying available 15 pounds or in a loot box. It's very, very clever, but also very, very deceptive and very, very, I would almost say deceitful in terms of the way that children are drawn into this. There's feelings of temptation and compulsion, absolutely. You almost feel like you need to get this. Your friends have got it, so you need it. There is this element of, of boredom and escapism as well. One of the biggest challenges around um, in-app purchases or in-game purchases comes when it when it comes to things like gift cards. And again, I'll use my, my own son as an example. Um, had his birthday um, and he had 15, uh, sorry, 10 friends around his house for the party and each friend gave him a £10 gift card. And when I realised that, I realised that we'd done him very good intent. Parents thinking, well, that's something that he'll use, but perhaps not realising they'd actually just given him £100 worth of gaming credit. And obviously, he was desperate to spend it. Obviously, he wanted to spend it. Obviously, he demanded that he spend it. And the challenge really there was that um, there was no way to distract him from that. He wanted to spend it. He did spend it um, pretty much in one go. And after that, he was actually able to make progress in the game. He didn't buy loot boxes. He just went and bought the weapons straight away. He made quite significant progress in the game. But then what happened was he came to the next hurdle and he realised he no longer had £100. He had nothing. So therefore, he actually went from the high of getting to this point by spending £100 to the real lows of realising that was the only reason he got there. And then the real pressure comes in the parents being asked constantly, please, please, please. That's where the loot box comes in. Please. I don't want to spend £100, I want to spend £5 on five loot boxes and I promise I won't ever ask again. That's probably ringing in your ears as well. I've heard that expression so many times. So there's real, real issues around loot boxes. And as I say, the gift cards are done with very good intent, but can actually create quite a challenge to the, the person that's receiving it and the, the pressure that comes as a result of that. Now, I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that we really are running out of time and I want to ask, have some space for questions. I'm going to try to rattle through this next bit in five minutes, so we've got 10 minutes for questions. Let's challenge the thinking. Online gaming is a reality. People, young kids want to do it. We simply cannot say no. My qualification on that is unless there's a genuine concern around their safety. My strong advice is that we don't say no, we come to an agreement. Whether it's a reduced time, whether it's a set time, do that. Create a limit, create a rule and stick to that rule. For many young people, online gaming is their main social interaction. So if we are denying them that access, what other alternatives are we giving them so that they can continue to have that, that social context? Find out more. Don't necessarily judge the game based on what your child tells you or what, their child's, what your child's friend has told them. Look at the reviews and I'll show you a site that I would highly recommend for that. And as it says there, Whilst the age limits around buying games are legally binding, let's not pretend. It's, it's like social media. Let's not be naive and pretend that 10 year olds are not on Snapchat. Unfortunately, they are. Let's not pretend that 12 year olds are not playing games like Call of Duty, like um, Assassin's Creed. They are. So rather than simply thinking to ourselves it's not happening, let's think more crucially about how we support them. Key resources to, to, to use. The one that I would really plug particularly is a site that I've created called the Highland Schools Online Safety Centre. As I say, I'm running out of time to talk you through this. Go to this site, I'll send you the links to Alison so that it can be shared. The key part of this is in the section for parents, because in this section, what I've got is a Padlet that has got links to all the resources that I would highly recommend. This is the Padlet. Each of these tiles are a clickable resource. And for instance, one of the ones that I was going to show you, had I not run hideously over time, is one called Thrive Online, which has been created by ChildNet. 
This is a set of resources that are both for professionals and teachers, but also for parents. And in the parents one, what you've got are four really, really excellent resource packs that you can download that come with videos, that come with questions that you can use to help have that conversation with your child around digital well-being, healthy online relationships, online pornography, and also supporting children with um, aspects of this. The teacher professional one has got, um, I'll go into this one, has got lesson plans, activities around gaming, online grooming. The gaming one is the one I want to sort of draw to your attention today for any professionals that are here. It's really good. You download the pack and again, video, lesson outline, activities that you can use as a follow up. It's really good and specifically targeting children with additional support needs. So this um, Padlet that's built into the, the website has got loads and loads of excellent resources, including, just go back to the um, actual main uh, Highland Schools online safety site. So the resources to, for that are in the Padlet, but they're also further down on the actual site itself. A step-by-step -step tutorial guide as to how to do those things that you will constantly hear people saying you should do. Like, for instance, block a user in TikTok. I'll go down to the gaming ones, just so we're actually keeping it on track. Um, so Minecraft, you'll be told, you hear someone saying, put your parental controls on, on Minecraft. This will give you a step-by-step -step guide as to how to actually do that. Roblox, how do you block a user? One of the biggest issues on Roblox is children who are often targeted by other children or potentially by other adults. How do you do that? I wouldn't know how to do it. This gives you a step-by-step -step video that you can simply follow and you can do it literally step-by-step -step how you would actually do that. So rather than just simply telling you to do it, these tutorial guides will actually show you how to do it. So I would highly recommend looking at these for not only for gaming, but also for any social media sites. So we've got Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp um, and TikTok. So this is all on the Highland Schools site. Sources that I would highly recommend are from the National Online Safety site. They have got, without question, the best guides that you could choose to look at. If you go to the National Online Safety site, you create an account, which is completely free. You can then download any of their 200 plus guides. They're constantly updating it. They do a new one every single week on a Wednesday. I would almost stake my house mortgage on the fact that any game or app or site that young people are using will be on here. It's almost un almost unlikely that they would not have something on this. They do it in a really nice way. They tell you what you need to know about it as a parent, but most importantly, they tell you tips about how to keep your children safe on that particular platform. So the National Online Safety Site and the Highland Schools Online Safety Centre are the two resources that I would highly recommend alongside Common Sense Media. I talked about reviews. Common Sense Media is, in my opinion, the best site to go to to find out reviews, not only of, of games and social media, but also for books and movies. They do really impartial reviews based on the facts. They don't try to prejudice it and say, you know, this is not a great game. They'll tell you this is what the game is about. This is the age range. This is the type of game it is. And then in effect, they're saying to you, you make a decision yourself, but having got the information that you might need. And the final slide is just to show you that in schools, we are now starting to actually teach online safety. And within online safety teaching, we're actually touching upon gaming as well. So no longer are we just simply saying to parents at home, you need to do all the online safety stuff. We're actually now introducing this curriculum from a project, a, a site called Project Evolve, which actually teaches children how to stay safe online. You can access it as a parent or as a professional and see what this looks like. You just create your account and you get access to all the materials which go from age three up to age 18. Schools are now being encouraged to embed this into their curriculum. So they're actually gonna be teaching online safety and gaming on a very regular basis rather than simply doing it for um, Internet Safety Day. Apologies for running over time. Um, final reflection, 
thinking what you would take away from this session. What is that one thing that you will do? Whether it's to go and look at one of the resources, the National Online Safety Guides, Common Sense Media, that Highland Schools page, whether it's having that conversation with your child about what their gaming habits are. Just having a little one step. You know, I, I hate the sessions where someone says to you, take away one thing, but you know, kind of do that. Do take away one thing, do it manageably, you probably heard lots of information that, that maybe your brain is starting to whirl and you're thinking, what am I going to do with this information? I think have a think about the one or two things that you would take away and try and do based on the back of this. And of course, if anything um, is not clear for you, always happy to answer questions either through Alison or, or Carrie or whoever, or come in to me directly. OK. I know I've run badly over, so I'll pass you back to Alison, I think, or to Carrie. I'm not sure who I'm going back to, but um, I will stop presenting. Uh, well, I'd just like to say thank you so much, Robert. Oh my goodness, such an amount of useful um, information there. Um, some some great ideas and some really good uh, websites for people to look at. Um, so thank you so much for uh, putting that together for us. Um, it was absolutely great.